probably send out, or Connor will send out a message on what we have going on coming up. And we're just going to continue to keep going on, you know, through the school year and see what happens. So um, I'm going to introduce Charlie, awesome guy. soul transformation. So the base verse for this is Romans 1, 2, and that is, I'm going to go Romans 12, 1 through 2 at the moment, but it is, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So that's our base verse for this sermon, the soul transformation. And um, I'm very happy to have Rice here to let me do this opportunity. So I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful for my family and my friends for coming out to watch me and my teachers in the back for coming to watch me today. I'm very thankful. And um, I'm not very good with time perception, so I'm not sure how long this sermon is going to actually be, but it's going to be longer than 15 minutes, so that's going to be, it's going to be okay, and um, so we're going to kind of get in, so the questions at the bottom is, do you ever struggle to seek God's word, and what if I told you it could get easier, and this sermon is about how God can transform our souls, so sometimes we struggle with God's word, and life gets in the way, and our family gets in the way and our friends get in the way of the things that we want to do. But even through the struggles of seeking God, will it always be this difficult? Um, will it become easier? Will um, reading the Bible become a habit for us? And will I eventually get into it more than I already am? Um, those are kind of the questions that we're going to be going through in the sermon. And um, I'm kind of going to start with so how many of us have actually like lashed out at somebody in anger? Yeah, a lot of us, almost pretty much all of us. Um, how many of us have done something that we probably shouldn't have? Yeah, yeah, okay. And how many of us struggle with God's wants for us in our lives? That should be everybody. How many of us struggle with God's wants in our lives? Everybody? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, everybody's hands should have been up if they weren't up. Um, but we can all struggle with what God wants for us in this world. And we can all struggle to find the godly things in the worldly feelings and the godly things in this worldly situations. And it goes for everybody. Everybody goes through that. Um, we all fall short of the glory of God. And we have to let him do the work for us. Because if we don't, then we won't be able to fulfill God's will. And that's something really important that we have to go through um, and realize in, in our lives and through this world. So I had a short sermon when I practiced it. So I added a couple things in, which is a little last minute. But um, speaking of falling short of the glory of God and letting him do the work for us, um, when I started this sermon, I was actually working at the Holiday Inn. And I'm a lifeguard at the Holiday Inn. And I just recently uh, quit because of school which is very sad, but I did. And um, I started it uh, when it was raining outside. It was stormy and um, I had my notebook and I had my Bible and I was outside with my MacBook, my notebook, my Bible, and I was sitting on a pool deck chair and I had an umbrella over me protecting me from the rain so that I wouldn't get wet because I wanted to start this. I was get, it was late, I was late, okay? I was procrastinating and I needed to start it. So I'm sitting on these chairs, and I'm starting my sermon, and I'm looking through, and I'm, I'm listening to all these sermon videos, and I'm listening, and I'm listening, I'm like, oh gosh, how am I gonna do this? What do I do? So I'm going through, and I, I end up picking my, my base verse, which is Romans 12, 2, and um, that particular day, yeah, it was raining, and the head lifeguard there uh, was with me, 
and he was watching me, and he was noticing, and he didn't look really happy about it, um, because he thinks that my religion and this religion is foolish. He doesn't believe in it, and he doesn't, he doesn't think it's uh, practical, and he's very worldly. And um, so I was doing my sermon, I was sitting down in my chair, and um, I left to go back inside to grab my bag because I forgot something. So I'm walking inside and um, I get whatever I need and um, I come back out and my umbrella is closed and my MacBook is covered in rain, my Bible is covered in rain, and my notebook is covered in rain. And all I could do was look and the only person sitting there was the head lifeguard. And I was like, looking at him, he looked at me, and he was smiling. I was like, yeah, it was you. It was you, wasn't it? And it was him. So, in that moment, yeah, I was in a situation, and he can say, wow, he really didn't do anything about it. He really didn't care, you know? He really thought not a lot. He was just like, okay, whatever, and kept going on and kept doing his sermon. He opened the umbrella back up, and I sat down, and I kept doing my sermon. And when he told me to move, I moved to the lifeguard stand where it was rain, and I did it in the rain on the wet paper. So this, this is one of the situations where we just have to let God take it over for us, and we have to let him come over the situation. And, um, you know, sometimes we can't handle that. Sometimes we do lash out at people, and, you know, sometimes it gets the best of us. Um, but we have to remember that in certain situations, we have to let the Lord take the Lord knows best, and we have to give him the, the glory in the situation. So go ahead to the next slide. Uh, do not be anxious about everything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, which is Philippians 4, 6 through 7. And 1 Peter 5, 7 is casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Figured that these were pretty good verses to go with um, anxiety and um, you know letting God take care of the work for us because it really is important when you think that it really isn't. Um, go ahead, next slide. So, how many of us have seen the show Fixer Upper? Like a lot of us on reality TV. So most of us know what Fixer Upper is. It's practically you know these two people. And they go around to random cities and random towns, and they ask people, or people come to them, I'm not really sure, I think people come to them, and they ask them to renovate their homes. And usually, when you see the first picture of that home, it's pretty messy. It is pretty ugly, um, it's usually dirty, it's usually messy, and it usually has something extremely ugly about the house, which they want to fix. So usually it's like made in like 1780 or something, or 1840, and it's like worn down, and it's like fallen apart, and I've totally never lived in a house like that before. Um, <laughs> but the houses are so messy, and they're ugly. And um, what they do is they go and they go to that house and they spend the next five to six weeks renovating that house to make it look brand new. The owners don't get a sneak peek. The owners don't get any look. They get nothing. But all they get to do is put hundreds of thousands of dollars into these people's hands and they don't know what they're doing with it. So, but, one, but once they're done, not only do they love the house, but, well, yeah, they love the house. That is what they do. They love the house. And they're like, wow, this is amazing. And you can see, like, in the show, they have, like, this, this poster where it's, like, the old house, and they close the eyes, and then split it in half, and then the whole poster comes apart, and we're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And it looks so great. And um, I feel like that this could be related to our spirit as, as a person. Go ahead to the next slide. But um, it can relate to our spirit. And sometimes spiritually, we can really feel like we're worn down. And we can really feel like we're torn apart. Um, sometimes we feel like, you know, we're just so messy and that we've sinned so much that I don't want anybody to see this. Nobody needs to come inside of my house. Nobody needs to come in here. And you can feel really bad. You can feel horrible. 
And a lot of times we're afraid to invite God inside of our homes because they're so messy and they're so dirty. And you know it's going to take months to clean up. And you know that you've got so much to do. You've got grass to mow. You've got a moldy pool to clean. You've got all this other stuff that you have to clean. And it's just so messy. And there's just so many things that you have to do and so many things that you don't want anybody else to see. But Jesus doesn't care about that. Jesus doesn't care about, you know, how much you have sinned. Jesus doesn't care about what has happened in your life or what you have done. He just wants you as a person. And when we enter a life of Christ and when we open our Bible and read the word and, and read what he says and we live out our lives as Christ, he helps clean our home. And he comes in and he helps clean us and clean our house. And it's just when he does that, it just transforms us and it renews us. And you don't really realize it until you're at the end point and you're like, wow, this really did happen. This really did happen. So um, something that I personally have started noticing more and more, and I'm sure others notice more, is change. And change is something we all go through. We all endure change. And some of us hate change, and some of us like change. And some of us go through little bits of change, and some of us go through a lot of change. Um, I know there's a lot of people that I know that go through change, tremendous change, in months. Some people go through tremendous change in years. Some people go through tremendous change, change, change in days. Some of us just, I've seen a lot of people that have a really hard time and go through change every single day. And it's, it's hard for them. And something I've been experiencing, uh, change I've been experiencing, um, has been more on a supernatural level, obviously. Um, see, I've been pulling out my Bible a little bit more, and I've been thinking about Christ on a daily basis, and I've been applying my word to his life, and, or my life, and um, not too long ago, uh, I was driving in my car, and I was going down some back roads, listening to music, and I was thinking to myself, like, where am I? Like, where am I in my relationship with Christ? Where am I in my, my journey? with Christ. And, you know, I was just thinking these questions to myself. And I just kept telling myself, like, yeah, I'm near him. Like, yeah, yeah, I know. Like, I am. I'm near him. Like, I'm good. There's, there's no problem. I'm good. And, you know, as I was sitting and as I was thinking, I was just realizing, like, something's just not right. And I just kept thinking about it. And I was like, something's just not right. It just doesn't feel right. And it kind of hit me like a train. And I realized that I've been telling myself that, you know, I'm close to God, but I'm really not. I've really come so far from where I used to be, and I realized that I'm on the other side of the room from where I really thought I was. I was letting my pride get in the way of my relationship with Christ. I was letting my pride say, hey, you're right there. Don't worry about what you're doing. You don't need to change anything. Nothing needs to be changed. You know, you're fine. And Letting that pride get in the way um, can really affect your relationship with God because not only does that pride prevent you from thinking about God and, you know, indulging in his word, um, it brings you further away from him. And um, it was just something that really, like, hit me in the moment, and my heart really fell to my stomach. And I knew exactly what sin had led me to that point. I knew exactly why I was here at that very moment. I knew why I was led astray. I knew why I was in the dark. And I knew why I was in the situation I was in. And I realized that I really need to fix this because it's broken and I need to fix it because this is not going to work for me. And throughout my whole life, I've had him. Realizing that I didn't have him as strong as I did before hit me pretty hard. Um, go ahead and uh, switch the slide. So, um, but this time there was something. Oh, oh, we're missing a picture. Um, but anyways, so while well, they can see, maybe they can figure that out. Okay. Um, anyways, so when I realized this, um, I didn't just 
you know, realize that. You know, I realized this, this hit me like a train. Um, but there was something that was different this time. And it was the fact that, you know, I was there. I was in this moment and I was being hit with this, you know, this realization that, you know, something's just not right. But I realized that what was different this time is that I didn't fall all the way to the bottom of the pit. I was only a fourth of the way there before he grabbed my hand and pulled me back up. See, like, when we are starting, and like, because I am born into this religion and my family is blessed with this religion, um, he always has pulled my leg. He always has said, I'm here, I'm here. Um, but for some people, it isn't like that because they don't know. And when you actually start to get into the word and you hit a certain point, he never, and I realized that this was where I was in my life. This is the point that I was at. He was running after me when I was in this hole. And it was just an amazing kind of epiphany that I had that, you know, this is what was happening right in front of me. This is what was happening. You know, he left He left the 99 to come find me. And it happens, and it is for all of you. He will leave to come and find you, and he will come and, and get you. He will come and grab you. Um, so I'm gonna... Anyways, oh, oh yeah, there it is. There's the picture. Yeah, that's the picture. Um, and. This is just how I felt. This is how I felt in that moment, and it really captures everything because just I, I just think it's I think it's an amazing picture. And um, the lamb who just lost in the storm, in the rain, wind, mud, um, is there, and there's Jesus in the background, and he's running, um, and he's running for me because he wants me. And it's just such a powerful picture, in my opinion, and I think it can describe each and every one of our lives. I truly do. I really think you can describe all of our lives. And, um, yeah, you can go ahead. The next one. Um, so this is, um, something I'm going to say. Just give me one second. So, okay, so, speaking of the picture, when, when Jesus calls us and he says, get up, it's time to go. And he says, get up, I have something for you. He says, get up. It's time to clean. You need to do something. We need to get up. We can't be sitting there because when we sit there, we are rejecting him. And we are rejecting him from what we want. And we're rejecting him from being a part of our lives and in our plan. And when he's at the door and he's knocking and he's yelling, let me in, he's, he wants to clean for us. But we can't just, he can't just walk in. We have to let him in. Because if we don't let him in, then we wouldn't have free will. And that's exactly what free will is. Free will is letting him interfere or not. And I think that's something that's confusing with a lot of people. Because people will say, oh, well, you know, if, you know, he wanted me, he would just, you know, come into my life and make me Christian. That's not how it works. Free will is practically him. So most people think of it as Jesus has a book. And he writes down exactly what's going to happen in our lives. And, you know, he just knows what's going to happen. And that's false. He creates us. He does know what's going to happen in our lives. But it's almost like he sees our lives in a timeline. We still have the choice to do anything we want because we have free will. But he's standing there and he watches. He watches our story. We create our story. We write in the book. He looks at the book. He watches our story from wherever he is, however he does it, because he watches everybody's story at the exact same time, and he can see past, present, and future. But he decides where he's going to intervene. And you are someone in your own life who can choose whether you want to follow his intervention or you want to reject his intervention. And the more you follow his intervention, the more he's going to intervene. But the more you reject his intervention, he's not going to stop intervening. So the more that you let him in, the more he's going to come in. When you open the door, he's going to start cleaning. When you tell him, okay, I'll let you clean the kitchen, he's going to clean the kitchen. 
when you tell him, I want you to clean the living room, he's going to clean the living room, and he's going to end up cleaning the entire house until the entire house is transformed and renewed. So, uh, let's see. So when we open, I kind of just said this, but when we open our Bible and we learn about Jesus, uh, it influences our lives. And when we start to think about him more, or maybe that Bible verse comes up in that rough situation and you back down and you just say, what would Jesus do? The more knowledge you have on these things in your life, the more Jesus can enter your heart and enter your mind and speak to you. Um, if you can't hear Christ in your life, open your Bible because that is his very words spoken on a piece of paper. That is him talking to you. If you are struggling or you have a question, Open your Bible to a random page and read the first verse that you see. Because I can guarantee you that almost every single time it will, it, it will relate to you. Every single time. No matter what it is, because it's just such an open-ended book and he works that way. That's how he works. Um, the more knowledge you know follows the greater influence and the greater transformation on you. Because the more knowledge you know, the more he's able to speak to you. If you're in that rough situation and all of a sudden a verse comes up to you and you're like, oh, that verse, I really remember that verse. That could be the answer to what you're going through right now. That could be what you need to do. That could be what you've got to do or what's going on. And that can really help you with that. And that's why the Bible is such an essential piece of information in Christianity and in a Christian's life because it helps you respond to hard and tough situations throughout your life. No, the Bible's not going to tell you whether to buy a dishwasher or a clothes dryer because you're low on money. But it is going to tell you that Jesus provides for you. And it is going to tell you that he will provide for you no matter what. And you don't need that clothes dryer or you don't need that dishwasher because he will provide for you in any circumstance. Um, let's see. So... If you need help, if you need help with the Bible, Romans is how to live a Christian life. Galatians about, is about pursuing a life of holiness. Uh, Philippians is having joy in trials. And Philippians is known as one of the happiest books in the Bible, and it was written in prison. It was written in prison by a man who was alone. Paul was alone in prison because he murdered somebody. And he wrote an entire section in the Bible and it was one of the happiest books in the Bible. That's insane. I don't understand how one single, let alone man, can um, write an entire book um, on being happy in prison um, after murdering somebody, but he did. And that's the power of God right there, is that he can, he can really, in, he can influence you, and he can transform you, and he can renew you. Um, you can go ahead, oh wait, no. This is the slide. This is the slide. So this is my message here. God does not call the prepared. He prepares the call. God does not call the prepared people. He prepares the call people. Um, Elijah was suicidal. Job killed himself. David had an affair. Moses was anxious. Paul was left alone in prison. He was also a murderer because he was left alone. Or well, that's why he was left alone in prison. Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. And Noah got drunk after the flood. And all of these people have a significant connection or section in the Bible, and they had tremendous sin, and they were all broken. Um, like all the people listed above, whether we have sinned more or less in a physical or mental sense, we're all sinners on earth. Um, but that doesn't stop Jesus from reaching all of these people. That doesn't stop Jesus from coming in and intervening with you or your life, and he, that this is what gives him such, such an amazing God, because he's just a forgiver, he forgives, and he forgives everything that you do. Um, go ahead to the next slide, which is Romans 3.23, and it is, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, because it's true. We all have sinned, and we all fall short of the glory of God, yet here we are, having him as our personal Savior, and he's in our um, next slide. Baptism. So baptism is something that can, known as transforming us or renewing us, and it's also called the liquid grave. 
because when you are baptized and when you are submerged in the water, it is a sense of leaving all of your sins behind and coming out as a brand new person. Um, so how many people here have been baptized? Okay. Um, does anybody know or want to share like what baptism is? I know I just said it, but like to you, like what is baptism like to you? Anybody want to share? spiritually born again and made new and our minds are renewed. Those waters in the baptism are parted and we go through and we come out the other side transformed and renewed. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, which is the last one I think is just the turn. Yeah. So um, this also can be bring back to an example of when Moses crossed the sea. Um, when Moses got to the Red Sea um, and all of his people, with all of his people, everybody was scared. Everybody was anxious, and everybody was, oh, wait, what do we do? We're stuck. We're at a dead end right now. What can we possibly do? The Israelites were scared. Moses was scared. Moses was anxious. The people were anxious. And he had questions that weren't always and exactly answered. Um, but not only were they now stuck in a dead end, they were also being chased by the Egyptians. They were also on a chase from an entire army. They're on foot, they're on horses. I think, were they on horses? Yeah, were they? The Egyptians? Chariots, okay, so yeah. So they were moving probably a lot faster than the people on foot, and they were still ahead of them. And um, God tells Moses, running short on time, trying to find a way where they should go, what they should do, God tells Moses to not be afraid, lift his staff, and part the sea. That sounds insane. Imagine being told that you're going to lift your stick and the waters are going to part in a hundred foot wall. Really? Are you serious? And Moses does it. And the waters part and the sea parts into, into two. And Moses leads his people through the sea. And this rough terrain, because it's not just a little flat, you know, little flat bottom to this ocean. There's rocks. There's all kinds of things that they have to overcome going through um, this uh, this part of the sea. And um, Moses leads his people through this rough terrain to make it to the other side. And as they're walking, the army is chasing them, and they are getting closer, and they are getting closer. And um, when they make it to almost the other side, they look behind them and they can see the army. The army's coming for them. The army's right there. And when they make it to the other side and the army is chasing them, God says, raise your staff so that the water shall enclose on the Egyptians. So Moses does it, and the Egyptians vanish into the sea. And the sea closes. And not only are they gone, but they are never to be seen again. And that is a way that, you know, you that, that is baptism. When you come back out of those waters and the waters close behind you, your sin not only goes away, but it is never to be seen again, and it should never define you. Um, so just like Moses in the story and the Israelites in the story, we just leave everything behind, and we step forward into a life of Christ after this baptism, and we are new, newly transformed and newly renewed souls. Um, so I think, I think I'm going to around this point, and I'm going to have the worship team come up, and we're going to play some music, and um, we'll start our end.
you guys now, we're going to transition into a time of worship. And to really, it's so good to hear a word, but to take that word and now reflect on it. So we just invite you guys to stand up. Um, feel free to come up in the front. We're going to go into a time of uh, reflection and worship.
because when you do, it really does change your life. And um, will you give Jesus the time? And will you give Jesus the chance to come into your life and start renewing you? Because I can promise you that it's better than anything else that you're going to think is better than you. And it really is, it really is something that's great. So let's worship.